Hi everybody, this is Walt Cassidy. I'm coming to you from Central Brooklyn. Today is Sunday, March 29th, 2020. And I am going to be reading from my book, New York Club Kids by Walt Paper. And today's chapter is chapter seven, Under the Influence. There's always been this cliche about living fast and dying young that people buy into and romanticize generation after generation. When you're young, the cliche goes, it's the danger in life that makes it worth living. You're fed from a wellspring of vibrancy that convinces you that you're invincible and everything seems to heal or be replaced by another point of interest. As the club kids scene continued to evolve, our drug use began to escalate. I was keenly aware that the lifestyle I was beginning to live might kill me, and I wondered to myself if that was what I wanted. I knew it was a possibility, and I felt that I was probably okay with it, but there was a part of me that was not totally convinced that an early death was my fate. I imagined myself surviving and becoming an oracle-like figure like William Burroughs, whose influence transcended generational boundaries. By the time the rave scene had peaked and was beginning to run its course, most of us had grown a bit too familiar with taking acid and ecstasy, and those particular drugs were losing their rebellion quotient. We were looking for a new door to break through. Ecstasy was rumored to be cut with either speed or heroin. I'm not a chemist, nor have I ever made or sold E, so I don't know anything about the drug's definitive composition. But I did notice that there were two types of ecstasy going around. One was speedy and the other was more relaxed. I always liked the one that I believed was cut with heroin, but others have suggested that those downer effects might have actually been the result of adding ketamine to the drug's mixture. Some of us within the inner circle of the club kids started considering heroin. The Warhol superstars, against whom we frequently measured ourselves, were notorious users. We began weighing the odds. Was it too dangerous? Could we possibly explore it and survive without spiraling down like everyone else who had been associated with the drug? Once we spoke of it, of course there was no way we were not going to try it, despite our full awareness that we were embarking on a game of Russian roulette. We were hardwired for rebellion. There had been a huge influx of heroin in the city, so it seemed pretty easy to access. In the East Village, there were obvious cop spots where Puerto Rican guys would stand outside of empty buildings or pull stashes from bushes to sell to the junkies, who would pace up and down the street waiting to score. We made our newfound interest in heroin known to the rest of our group, because there was no point in doing anything unless everyone on the scene bore witness to it. We put word out that we wanted to try the drug. One Thursday night at Limelight, a fellow club kid named Junkie Jonathan, who had been a part of the It Twins crew, showed up to the club with the goods. A group of us gathered together downstairs on the main dance floor and nervously discussed whether or not we should go through with trying something so dangerous. I remember seeing Pebbles shake her head with a disappointed and frightened expression on her face that said, this is bad, this is really, really a bad decision. Nevertheless, those of us who decided to take the risk collectively scurried up the stairs to the private offices at the back of the club. The whole experience felt like a childish, I'll do it if you do it type of dare. Jonathan proceeded to cut out a series of tiny lines on a desk and was quick to point out that heroin was much stronger than the drugs we were used to snorting, so we only needed a tiny bit. He also warned that if we took too much, there was a good chance that we would throw up, which was not a good look. It seemed like the whole club knew what was going on, maybe because it was not that crowded, but more likely because we had told a good number of people that we were trying heroin for the first time, and word spread fast. We had set ourselves up to be lab rats. Once we snorted the little lines, we came back downstairs for everyone to observe the effects. I don't remember having especially profound feelings about the drug's high, except that it felt okay. None of us had fallen down dead, at least. Unlike the first time I took acid, the experience wasn't astonishingly interesting or transformative. For me, the idea of breaking through a taboo and being dangerously bad was where the first hook resided, not the actual high. Taking heroin made me feel like I was part of an underground members-only club. It aligned me with the icons that I admired from the past. As ridiculous as it sounds, there was also a style aspect to being a junkie that I found appealing. 
Just like we had moved through vintage clothes, plastic supply shops on Canal Street, platform shoes, the fetish gear at Body Worship, and the baggy raver pants at Liquid Sky, now we were going to try on the vernacular and lifestyle of being a junkie. We knew that this move could be disastrous, but we embraced it publicly like a trophy. It wasn't a dirty secret that we sought to hide away. Part of the thrill and excitement of doing heroin was having to score it on the street, which often landed us in some sketchy situations. There was one particular cop spot in an abandoned building on 4th Street and Avenue D that I found pretty daunting. There was a guy at the front door with a gun who would check up and down the street to make sure that there weren't any cops or suspicious characters around. Once I came face to face with him, I had to quietly mumble D so that he knew that I was there to buy dope. After entering the building, I'd walk to the back of the stairwell where a bucket covered in white tape would drop down on a string. It had two compartments. One side was marked with a C for crack, and the other was marked with a D for dope. I would put my money into either side depending on what drug I wanted. Once I shoved the money in, the dealers would pull the bucket back up to the top of the stairs, put my drug of choice inside, and then drop it back down. The guy at the door would hold me inside as long as he felt necessary, releasing me back onto the street only when he thought I could leave undetected. The whole scenario was quite scary and intimidating, but that's what made it exciting. One morning while back at the 24th Street Club Kid house, we were indulging in our normal post-club ritual of breakfast, mint julep masks, and bonding. Now that heroin was part of the equation, buying dope became a regular part of the after-hours routine. One or two people from the group would gather up the funds and take a taxi down to the Lower East Side in the middle of the night to score. Everyone took their turn doing this run, but I managed to weasel out of it most of the time by offering to buy someone else their drugs if they picked them up. I liked the sense of adventure behind the madness, but I was still a little frightened by the whole process and I feared being arrested. After the dope arrived, I got into an engaging conversation with the newest arrival to our group while sitting on the stoop outside of the apartment. She was a Parsons fashion student from Chicago named Jonna Davis. I don't know who brought her into the mix, but all of a sudden she was just there. Jonna was very intelligent and interesting, but she didn't have an extreme club kid look like the rest of us. She was more in the range of someone like Chloe, utilizing streetwear and proper fashion and mixing in elements of irony and androgyny. Jonna was quite different in tone, dark and earthy in her physical features, as well as her personal style. Her family was of Polish descent, and that Eastern European flavor came through in her physical appearance. She wasn't especially girly or butch, but she frequently incorporated menswear into her look. Jonna and I got to talking, and I mentioned that I was growing tired of living at the 22nd Street Club Kid house. The whole situation with Joski and the revolving door of people had grown old. The fact that some of us were doing heroin and others were not created a dividing line within the larger umbrella group. Coincidentally, Jonna was looking to move out of her space too, so for fun we began brainstorming our ideal places to live in the city. The Chelsea Hotel came up immediately. It was an unattainable option, but we both loved the gorgeous black balconies, the neon sign, and the building's distinctive pedigree of previous tenants. So many of our favorite figures from the past had lived there. We figured there must have been some really interesting ghosts in that place, but neither one of us had ever dared to go inside. We thought for some reason that it was off limits and that we weren't allowed to just walk in without a purpose or an invitation. I guess we really bought into the mystique that surrounded the building's history. We came up with a plan to infiltrate it by pretending that we were looking for an apartment. We hoped to get a free tour and then just leave. That afternoon, we wandered over to the hotel's location at 222 West 23rd Street. We nervously made our way through the giant glass doors to the front lobby, which was filled with paintings and sculptures. To our surprise, the first person that we saw was Sinead O'Connor. She was sitting by herself in the corner, staring off into space. We thought that was an interesting sign, but we kept our cool and pretended to not notice her. We approached the desk. The owner, Stanley Bard, asked if he could help us. We told him that we were looking for an apartment and would like to see any spaces that might be available. He inquired as to what type of space we were looking for and we said that we weren't sure but that we wanted something that was affordable and that had a good balcony. Mr. Bard instructed one of the guys on the staff to show us room 215. Instead of taking the elevator, we walked up the stairs to the second floor where he had unlocked the door to the room. 
It was pretty compact studio space, but it had very high ceilings. A long hallway that also served as a kitchen stretched from the front door to the main room. After inspecting all the interior details of the room, including the walk-in closet, we made our way to the glass doors that led to the balcony. I never would have imagined what we were about to find behind those doors. The apartment led out onto a huge double balcony that was centered directly above the building's entrance on 23rd Street. The hotel featured only two of these grand balconies. We looked up and right above our heads was the iconic Chelsea Hotel neon sign. It was as if all the forces of the universe, along with a couple bumps of heroin, came together in that one moment. It was destiny in its purest form. How could it be that we were just talking about these balconies and that sign, and within what felt like an instant, we were being offered the opportunity to claim this iconic space? The apartment itself wasn't grand in scale by any means. It was just a studio apartment, but it came with that extraordinary balcony, the famous neon sign, and the fact that it was the centerpiece to the notorious Chelsea Hotel, this historic landmark was arguably one of the most notable addresses in the history of New York. We had to find a way to move in, and we did. It was at this moment that everything began to skyrocket. The Club Kids first appeared on the daytime talk show Geraldo in 1990, which was an important breakthrough. In the late 80s and early 90s, daytime talk shows were a huge outlet. There were tons of them, each with an insatiable need for interesting and controversial content. The club kids were ideal fodder. We were young, looked shocking, loved talking about ourselves, and were accessible because we lived in New York City. The first talk show that hosted me was The Jane Whitney Show in March of 1993. The topic was contemporary youth movements. The club kids were to appear alongside transgressive punk performer Gigi Allen, who was known for brutalizing his audiences by initiating bloody assaults and performing naked while covered in his own urine and feces. He was truly shocking, at least conceptually. Alan was scheduled to appear first in the taping. Michael Alec, Julie Jules, Richie Rich, and I would join him on stage. A limousine came to transport us to the green room of the television studios. I borrowed an outfit made completely of ace bandages from this guy designer and club personality Michael Schmidt had created it. Schmidt was responsible for designing all the chainmail looks that Cher had worn in the 80s and some incredible dresses for Debbie Harry, who was his close friend using materials like razor blades and guitar picks. Schmidt had also been enlisted to design the engine room in the basement of Palladium. From the green room, we cautiously watched Alan rant and rave at the host and the audience while wielding this giant stick. None of us wanted to sit near him out of fear of being bashed if he happened to get out of control. These talk shows had a history of going off the rails, like the Geraldo taping, in which all of these skinheads started brawling, eventually breaking the host's nose. Since I had grown up in the punk scene, Alan's posturing was a little bit more familiar to me than the rest of our crew. I gave in and agreed to sit closest to him. As we were escorted out onto the stage, I could feel my heart pounding and the blood surging up the back of my neck out of nervousness. I was afraid that this would be noticeable on camera and I tried my best to remain composed and not rattle out of my chair. I was the first to be questioned. I tried to explain why we as club kids were paid to show up at nightclubs. I was a little uncertain myself because at that point I was still only 20 years old and trying to grasp everything that was happening to me in this new lifestyle. Michael, Richie, and Julie continued to break down how being a club kid was a viable career strategy. I felt that our team's chemistry was off. We fumbled over each other, grasping for as much individual airtime as possible. That show is a good example of how different we all were as individuals. For the most part, our differences contributed to the dynamic overall effect of the club kids, but we ended up stepping on each other's toes quite a bit during that taping. To everyone's surprise, we got on really well with Alan. As soon as the cameras were off, he was as nice as could be. He turned to me at one point and said, I really like your outfit, <laughs> which I thought that was really sweet. We were just like two normal queens discussing looks. Michael ended up giving him a rehypnol on camera, which was edited out for the broadcast. For years, Alan promised to kill himself on stage, but instead he died of an accidental heroin overdose at the St. Mark's Hotel just a few days after that taping. As I reflect back on that moment in time, I can't help but wonder if the universe was sending us a very clear warning about our heroin use. 
As Jonna and I settled into our brilliant new nest at the Chelsea Hotel, both of the previous club kid houses broke apart. Christopher and William's relationship fizzled out as we all headed into heroin addiction, some of us faster than others. Christopher fell into the pit pretty quickly. We all had our own methods of dodging full-blown physical addiction. My technique was never to do heroin two days in a row. I would break it up by doing different drugs on different days of the week. The members of our group who were doing dope daily seemed to spiral down faster than those of us who paced ourselves. I love Christopher, and in many ways he was my favorite club kid. I always imagined him as the club kid version of the classic pinup boy, like a 1950s teen idol with clown makeup and blood. One morning while we were cuddling and nodding out from heroin, we did start to mess around, but nothing materialized. We were probably too high, and it was a bit too incestuous. We were more like brothers at that point. William and I grew very close after he and Christopher split. We never became boyfriends, but I eventually found myself head over heels in love with him. There was a strong personal connection between us, which was further intensified by the chemical bond created by our drug-infused lifestyle. But what connected us more than anything was the visual impact that we created as a duo. We were both very tall, but William was taller and provided a distinctly boyish compliment to my more feminine look. By this time, I was less interested in creating freaky insect-like effects and was more focused on refining my makeup skills in the pursuit of beauty and fashion. Not long after John and I moved into the Chelsea Hotel, William followed our lead and secured an apartment on the third floor. His dad, who was a carpenter, built custom loft beds for both apartments so that we could better economize our limited spaces. William's loft included a number of shelves to store all of his records and multiple glass tanks to house his collection of pet snakes. Over the months, I hand-painted his loft with neon green and purple camouflage, and he covered the floor with purple carpet. With our new loft installed, I was able to set up my drafting table to do illustration work, as well as a clear section of the wall for large-scale painted canvases. The Chelsea Hotel years were very productive for me, with many interesting collaborative gigs and exciting people entering my orbit. Even though it was a period marked by heavy drug use, I remained dedicated to my art and my workflow was steady and consistent. I made a number of illustrations for album covers, magazines, t-shirts, film credits, and skateboards. Makeup artist Matthew Anderson and his boyfriend, designer and model Zaldi Goko, lived upstairs from us at the hotel. We knew each other from the clubs, but our friendship solidified once I landed in room 215. Both of them are incredibly gifted, and it was always a wonderful experience when our worlds intersected. They formed a powerful image-making duo, with Zaldi designing and constructing garments and Matthew handling the makeup, photography, and art direction. Together, they created iconic looks for Lady Miss Keir, Suzanne Barsh, and RuPaul. Most of the visual aesthetics that people now come to identify with RuPaul and his television show Drag Race can be credited to the creative talents of Matthew and Zaldi. Matthew's signature makeup style, marked by intricate contouring and stylized eyebrows, has become the go-to makeup template for today's post-Drag Race queens. Zaldi was awarded an Emmy for his costume designs for the show. What many people don't know is that the original concept for a drag race first surfaced at a Disco 2000 event called Night of a Hundred Parties and was not the creation of RuPaul. For this particular night, the club hosted a hundred different parties simultaneously and printed an elaborate pamphlet detailing each party. One of the events was a drag race that was to be held on the main dance floor. It was not a competitive pageant like the television show, but was an actual relay race around the perimeter of the club's mezzanine. Contestants emerged from the intoxicated crowd and assembled on the main stage in hopes of winning a cash prize. A different station was set up in every corner of the mezzanine. In one section, there was a garment rack full of dresses. At another, there was a wig bar. And a third stop had a selection of high heels. Each participant was timed as they launched from the main stage, running as quickly as possible through the packed club and stopping at each station to put on a dress, a wig, and shoes. After their look was complete, they finished their lap around the club, landing back on the main stage in full drag. Whoever had the fastest time won the cash prize. It was pretty hysterical to watch, and it's funny to compare the original version to the hugely successful television brand with which the general public is now familiar. 
Over the years that I lived at the Chelsea, I ended up working with Matthew and Zaldi on a few different projects. They used me as a model for images that were created for Playboy and David Barton Jim. I also opened their fashion show at Suzanne Barsh's Inspiration Gala, which doubled as her wedding to David Barton. It was always a thrill and honor to work with Matthew and Zaldi. During this period, a young English model named Jo Reynolds started to appear in the clubs. She had been featured in ID and Face magazine and perfectly personified the glam meets dumpy, grungy baby look that we all loved. Her cropped white blonde hair was evocative of Edie Sedgwick. She was intelligent, creative, and charming. William brought her around for an introduction, and John and I both fell in love with her immediately. She decided that she was not going to return to London and instead remained in New York, moving into William's apartment. The four of us quickly bonded as a crew, all of us living together, taking drugs, working at clubs, and sometimes modeling together. Another club creative who appeared at the Chelsea Hotel was Impala, the visionary head of the art crew that oversaw the interiors for all of Peter Gation's mega clubs. After moving onto the third floor across the hall from Matthew and Zaldi, Impala filled his space with an impressive installation of plants, leftover stage props from the club, and a number of birds that flew freely throughout the space. One day he mentioned to us that he had a fiberglass lion that had been used as a prop for Grace Jones to sit on during one of her late night performances at Tunnel. After the show, they no longer had any use for it in the club, so Impala offered it to Jonna and me as a gift. We happily installed the giant white lion in the corner of our balcony, named him Leo, and designated him as our official guardian. I spent a lot of time seated on top of our ferocious new pet, often out of my mind on drugs. I imagined that I was some kind of otherworldly prince with Leo as my animal guide. At night, I watched the street lights throb and the taxi lights trail back and forth in front of our balcony above 23rd Street. People would sometimes look up and see me gazing below at them. Our beautiful balcony, complete with our lion guardian, felt like a throne. After heroin had thoroughly swept through the scene, everyone began to realize that the grip of the drug got very tight very quickly. Everyone seemed to start looking for exit routes or distractions in the form of different drugs. For me, that deterrent came in the form of ketamine or Special K. I noticed early on that heroin was too dominant of a force and consciously shuffled my drugs according to different days of the week. For nights that I was working in the clubs, like Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, I would stack multiple drugs on top of each other. It took me about three hours to get ready on work nights, and I would begin the process at 7 p.m. After napping in the afternoon until early evening, I'd go down to the deli and get a six-pack of Rolling Rock. I would sip on one while I was taking a long bath that involved shaving and moisturizing my whole body. Once my skin was all lubed up, I would sit on top of our bathroom sink and build up my makeup. At sunset, someone from our crew would head down to the East Village to cop dope. I would finish my makeup, pick out my clothes, and pin on whatever hair I was going to wear. By the time I was ready, the dope would arrive back at our apartment. After I got my purse and everything else together, I would shoot up. I learned how to use needles from watching the movie Drugstore Cowboy. Luckily, I never had to buy them off the street because Jonna had been prescribed hormone treatments by her doctor. She had shopping bags full of needles along with sterilized containers of water, gauze, and band-aids, which I would help myself to. I could tell that people were pretty jarred by the fact that I had started using needles instead of just snorting drugs, but no one ever confronted me. It puts you in a whole other category of addict. When you get to that point, people start expecting you to die, and I could feel that anticipation and fear. Most of our friends, even the heaviest of drug addicts, didn't go down that road. After taking my early evening shot, I would whisk down to the lobby and hail a taxi. Once inside, I'd slump down in my seat and gaze out the window as all the colored lights glowed and moved like a spore leading me into the night. Heroin created a warm and protective womb. I would arrive at the club and before dancing or hosting, I would get a vial of Special K from a dealer. I'd snort that throughout the night and if I fell into a K-hole, one of my friends would give me a bump of cocaine that could pull me out. I'd ride that roller coaster up and down until I finished my work shift then I'd head back home to the Chelsea. I'd sniff any remaining dope from earlier and smoke some pot to come down from all the other drugs in my system. 
To round out the night, I'd grab a cheese sandwich from the deli, head out to the balcony, and lay on top of Leah the lion until I was ready to sleep. Non-work nights were different. I spent Sundays sleeping off whatever I did on Friday and Saturday, usually for 24 hours straight. Mondays were a good day to stay at home, and I would use the time to get some drawing or painting done. At night, I might grab a bottle of red wine and some cocaine and listen to the soundtrack from The Hunger. For some reason, it combined really well with cocaine use. Many people in the clubs had started to snort Special K. You could easily get the powdered form from dealers in the clubs, but it was more economical if you bought it in liquid form and dried it out yourself. The liquid came in injection vials, and after reading on the bottle that it was meant to be taken intermuscularly, Jonna and Desi got the idea to try injecting it. I found out what they were up to, and not wanting to be left behind, I tried it myself. The high from injecting the liquid was more intense and much broader than snorting the powder, and I discovered that I was able to access untapped dimensions with which even acid had not put me in touch. An uncharted world of hallucinogenic experiences opened up. No one else we knew had tried it because no one else, to my knowledge, was using needles. I did some research and learned that injectable ketamine had been used by a small group of psychedelic practitioners in the 70s who were involved with the Buddy New Age movement in California. The visionary Dr. John C. Lilly used it in combination with isolation tanks that he had developed for his sensory deprivation studies. These experiments would become the inspiration for the movie Altered States. Lilly's peers were countercultural scientists and thinkers like Timothy Leary, Ram Dass, and Werner Erhard. Ketamine was discovered in 1962 and was used as a surgical anesthetic during the Vietnam War after its approval in 1970. Though an elite group of academic and spiritual seekers like Dr. Lilly first used the drug, social recreational use began to appear in the mid-1980s in the same dance party circuits in which ecstasy became prevalent. Ketamine would be classified as a Schedule III controlled substance by 1999. Injecting ketamine induced what could only be compared to a near-death experience, enabling me to reach what I assumed were pockets of space within the brain that carry the residue of past lives. What I was now exploring was much more extreme in its dimensional scope than any other normal high. As a result of my experiments, I began to sense that the universe was mapped out like a giant tree. At the end of every tiny branch existed an orb of accumulated experience from the soul's recurrent passage through multiple lifetimes. One's present life and body resided at the base of the tree trunk, where the roots penetrated the ground. Upon injecting ketamine, I'd flash back quickly through recent experiences, like shuffling a deck of cards, before heading towards the orbs in the outer reaches. I was able to feel and see myself traveling through some type of vein-like tube. After reaching my destination, which was always random, I would travel back through the tube until I was dropped out like a baby emerging from the womb. The walls of the tube were red and golden, lined with veins. I wondered if I was re-experiencing some type of fetal memory. Music was extremely important in this ritual. Sound was obviously the vehicle that carried me through the tube. Tori Amos, Edward K. Spell, and Dead Can Dance were the best musical carriers. John and I traveled so many times to Tori Amos's first two albums that we took to speaking about her as if she lived on our balcony with Leo the Lion. We went to some really interesting places on these time-traveling quests. I ventured back to the period of the dinosaurs, where I walked among them in a desert landscape. Another time I met my Irish ancestors. I was so moved by that particular experience that when I returned, I ran down the hall to William's apartment, describing to him with tears in my eyes how healing the contact had been. One of the stranger experiences we had was when John and I traveled to some place simultaneously. We both ventured to 18th century France, and when we got back, we appeared to be speaking fluent French. The skill evaporated pretty quickly, but for a few moments we were in complete communication using a language that neither one of us knew how to speak. When I returned from these excursions, my physical proportions appeared to be stretched and my sight produced exaggerated perspectives. My arms and my hands felt long and thin like an extraterrestrial, and my skin looked pale, oxidized green. My flesh seemed to have the consistency of crepe paper, 
It felt tight and shrunken like dehydrated fruit. Knowing that I occupied a space of wisdom, I would stand tall and regal. At times, it seemed I stood so high that I could look out over the city like some sort of master entity. These experiences were all really fascinating, and I still find them intriguing. I can't say that I didn't love indulging in them, because I did, but every experience in life comes at a price. I noticed that my short-term memory began to burn out, and speaking became challenging after prolonged use of ketamine. I'll never really know the full extent of the damage that I did to my brain and body during those years, but I imagine there was a lot more than I realized. Back at the Chelsea Hotel, a young photographer and club regular named Zach moved onto the seventh floor. He mentioned that he often saw me draped across the lion in the morning, <laughs> in the early morning hours, still dressed in my nightclub gear. As was often the case with our ever-expanding cast of creative friends, these kinds of conversations usually led to some type of collaborative adventure. Creativity was our primary mission. I saw no point in knowing or hanging out with someone unless it led to a creative project. By this time, Jonna had taken up a styling assistant job with Anne Slowey at W Magazine. I was good at doing my own makeup and was sometimes asked to do it on other people, but I would rarely accept the invitation. With shaky hands, I never felt confident enough to do makeup professionally, and I selfishly didn't want anyone else to have my look. Chloe would occasionally pop around to room 215 for visits. One day we decided to have a spontaneous photo shoot with Zach in our apartments in different locations around the hotel. I happened to have a stash of Valium, so we all popped one before starting. Jonna styled the shoot using clothes from our closet, and I did the makeup. We did it all purely for our own entertainment. Zach captured some lovely shots of Chloe on my balcony with Leo the Lion, and also some in William's apartment with his records. While he shot on film that time, Zach's primary format was Polaroid. He was always snapping away at the clubs and raves and amassed a large collection of portraits documenting many of the prominent nightlife personalities. In 1992, the Ballinger family, comprised of brothers Lon, Stephen, Doug, and Peter, reopened Webster Hall. The space served as a concert venue throughout the 80s under the name The Ritz until its closure in 1989. The Ballinger family, overseen by their mother, was originally from Toronto and was rumored to have ties to the circus and carnival industry. They certainly brought a circus-like vibe feel to the giant multi-floor space, which was originally built in 1886 at 125 East 11th Street. The new Webster Hall featured trapeze artists, fire dancers, and even a woman who was suspended high in the air above the dance floor, hanging only from her hair. The go-go boxes and bars were fitted with giant ropes for dancers to hold on to and use as props, which added to the circus-like feel. Lila Wolf and Richard Move were hired to work the door. The venue was a refreshing counterpart to the Gation-owned clubs, mostly because it welcomed a more diverse crowd with a strong Latin influence. Gation's clubs were far more advanced and impressive in terms of design and art direction, but their racial bias door policies could sometimes have a sterilizing effect on the crowds. The clubs were always intelligent and cerebral, but not always sexy. Webster Hall's circus undertones often came off as a little corny, but the crowd was loaded with sex appeal and positive energy, and the music was always great. New promoters Rain Voltaire and Peter A. took charge of staging the club's two signature parties, Makeup Room on Fridays and Queen on Wednesdays, both of which turned away from the techno format and refocused on house music. New DJ talents Young Richard and Steve Travolta were enlisted to oversee the decks. It was around this time that photographer Misa Martin entered the scene. While spending a summer photographing drag queens in Provincetown, she met a close associate of Patricia Field, who encouraged her to investigate the store and its colorful employees. There she met little Kenny and invited him to attend an exhibition that she was having at Avenue A Sushi in the East Village. Once he saw the dynamic quality of her portraits, he quickly chaperoned her to the new parties at Webster Hall. At Makeup Room, a spotlight was cast on a new clique of personalities that had deep ties to Sound Factory, where DJ Junior Vasquez captivated early morning audiences with his mesmerizing approach to house music. The Sound Factory crowd would go through some identity shifts as the 90s progressed, but in the early days its members were mostly Black and Latin, with a heavy infusion of peer queens in the ball community. 
Everyone held great respect for Sound Factory because of the integrity of the music and its refusal to implement the standard VIP door policy that every other club maintained. There were no complimentary VIP admissions. Everyone was equal and everyone paid to get in. Many of the people who worked at the large Gation clubs would go home after normal club hours, change into casual clothes, and then hit factory to dance well past sunrise. Since there was no priority given to VIP, there was no pressure to dress up. You went there to dance and indulge in the exquisite music that Junior offered. The venue operated in the tradition of places like Paradise Garage. No alcohol was served, but there would sometimes be mushroom or acid punches. From the Sound Factory crowd emerged a specific group of energetic personalities comprised of young fashion students from FIT, a fashion designer named Onyx Noir, and a trained dancer named Lena Bradford, who went by Gerlina. I noticed Lena passing one night at Disco 2000, but we didn't get to know each other until I started working at Makeup Room with Little Kenny. She was a complete powerhouse who took the club scene by storm with her mind-blowing athletic performances, positive energy, and the unique manner in which she punctuated almost every sentence with an affectionate sugar. <laughs> at Factory, Lena, Onyx, and all the FIT kids would carve out a runway on the main dance floor and pump at it all night long executing extreme fashion poses and high kick maneuvers. As an accessory to their antics, they had a crew of beautiful shirtless boys who would bring flashlights to the club and swirl the white spotlights up and down their bodies as they pranced back and forth. Their enthusiasm was so uplifting and fun that it made everyone want to participate in their makeshift runways. Rain noticed Lena's magic one night at Webster Hall and enlisted her as a host for the makeup room. All of the flavor and energy that her crew was giving at Factory was channeled into the new Friday night function. After the success of Makeup Room, Lena began performing at drag star Mona Foote's Star Search at the Tiny East Village Haunt Crowbar. It was at these parties that she met and competed against Candace Kane, a new personality with a sharp look and a performance style that was reminiscent of the Hollywood movie actress Anne Margaret. The two became inseparable friends and would often perform together as a duo. In addition to Webster Hall and Crowbar, these two came to rule over all the venues that were popular with the gay boys, such as Boy Bar, Barracuda, Pyramid, and Sugar Reef. The first party that I worked at Webster Hall was actually a rock and roll theme lounge called She that was hosted by Jojo Field and Miss Guy. I was hired to do the VIP rope at the entrance. Rock and Roll Church on Sundays at Limelight had been a long-running standard, and Michael T. staged the popular but intimate New York Nights at Pyramid, but in general, rock-themed parties during the early 90s were more of a specialized delicacy. There was a gap between Dean Johnson's Rock and Roll Thag Bar at The World and the new rock parties that surfaced in the mid-90s with grunge music. She hosted a number of rock-affiliated fashion personalities like Marc Jacobs and Anna Sui, who regularly attended the party with guests like actress and Rolling Stones muse Anita Pallenberg. Drag queens and the House of Field members, along with Iggy Pop, Debbie Harry, Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, all fell into that party. It was at She that I became friendly with bands like Lunachicks and their singer Theo Kogan, as well as Michael Schmidt. It was a fantastic party, but short-lived. East Village personality Mistress for Micah began hosting a party called Faster Pussycat at Boy Bar, but also combined drag and rock music. Both parties were the impetus for Michael Schmidt's hugely successful Squeeze Box, which he began hosting in 1994 at the Don Hills venue. Squeeze Box quickly became the most exciting party in town. Michael Schmidt was a veteran of the 80s club scene and brought all of his press-worthy music and fashion industry connections together for support. The party began early with a live band, after which Miss Guy would take over and DJ throughout the night. Mistress for Micah was the hostess and MC. Every week she invited a different drag personality to sing a selection of cover songs live with the Squeezebox house band. It was not unusual to see proper rock stars in the audience like Courtney Love, who once spontaneously jumped on stage to join for Micah during a performance. Lil Kenny was invited to sing one night and asked if Desi and I would join him on stage. We happily agreed to share his set with each of us performing a song of our own choice. Before we hit the stage, Formica asked us what the name of our group was. I happened to be wearing a mini skirt as a tube top with the word boob in giant letters written on it. I looked down at my outfit and proposed that we call ourselves boob. If 
three of us were a little different from the other drag queens that they enlisted to perform because we were technically club kids, and as such, we attracted a crowd that was called from the mega clubs where we worked. The people in our audience would not usually attend a rock-themed party, but the show ended up being pretty successful. We inevitably started thinking about performing again. Due to the success of Squeezebox, it seemed like everybody wanted to start a band or, at the very least, dodge lip-syncing in favor of live singing. Another performance-based party called Black Lips Performance Cult had been running at Pyramid on Monday nights since 1992. Its ensemble of performers began at Crowbar with the singer Anoni, formerly known as Anthony Hegarty, and performance artist Johanna Constantine. Hattie Hathaway discovered the duo and quickly urged them over to Pyramid, where they would have room to expand in a performance venue that could accommodate elaborate stagings. The troupe came to feature a large collection of personalities, including Kabuki from our club kid scene, and one of Anoni's peers from NYU, Michael Cavadias, who created the persona Lily of the Valley. Pyramid and East Village veterans like Floyd, Page, and James F. Murphy also joined the ensemble, as well as many others. It was an obscure night, but it earned them respect in the downtown scene. At times, there were more people on stage than in the audience, which made it feel like a secret performance. I met Lily in passing while he was working the bar at Jackie 60 and had developed solid friendships with Paige and Floyd, so it must have been through the invitation of one of those personalities that I ended up checking out their night. The shows were fairly long. With my quick tempo club kid attention span, I found them hard to endure in a single sitting. I loved the portions that I was able to sit for and began to regularly pop in to support the night. It was more than obvious that this group was bursting at the seams with talent. Over at Limelight, there was a tiny unused room in the very back of the club where I proposed setting up my own weekly art gallery on Saturday nights called the Little Paper Gallery. I had so many talented friends around me and wanted to utilize the resources of the club to give them a space and a small budget to show and promote their work. Every week a new artist would be given the space, a professionally designed invitation, and payment to do an installation. It did not go unnoticed to me that many of my friends, like those who were involved with Black Lips, were making incredible artistic and theatrical efforts with little to no budget or profit. Some of the people that worked in large nightclubs were being paid hundreds of dollars a night to basically stand around, do drugs, and drink free drinks, nothing involving creative investment. It seemed like a waste of resources. I worked on my paintings and illustrations independently, but I was always trying to steer the nightclub experience back towards creativity whenever the opportunity presented itself. If I could find a way to get a fellow artist who needed support into the club's budget, I would. The little paper gallery became my way to help support other artists. I encouraged fellow club kids like Kabuki and Desi to have exhibits in the gallery. Paige did a performance installation called Fashion Today, and we invited Lily of the Valley into the space to channel the ghost of Candy Darling. This was Lily's first real experience in the club kid world, and I think he was thoroughly terrified by how intensely druggy our crowd was. While he sat on a chair in a bubblegum pink wig and a Marilyn Monroe t-shirt, a team of club kids and our friends interrogated him. He didn't break character as the breathy Warhol superstar. I thought it was hysterical and took a couple of Polaroids to capture the moment. I didn't realize that he was so intimidated by the experience until he told me afterwards. The Little Paper Gallery was consistently well attended and brought important new blood into the club, so they offered to build a larger space for me just down the hall. Knowing that the tiny room in which I had first set up the gallery was now going to be empty, I started thinking about how it could be utilized. One night while passing through the lobby of the Chelsea Hotel, I bumped into Anoni. After quickly chatting and catching up, she mentioned that she was at the hotel to meet with Suzanne Barsh in hopes of securing some work. When I returned to my apartment, I had the idea to offer her the old gallery space and reached out to see if she had anything that she could imagine doing in there. She took me up on the offer and proposed transforming the room into a performance space with Johanna Constantine called the Knife and Flower Lounge. In addition to being paid to host and perform, they were given a weekly flower budget to create elaborate arrangements that served as centerpieces for the room. Anoni would take the arrangements home at the end of the night. It was a small gesture on my part, but I hoped that the weekly gig and the steady income would help support their creativity. 
things really came together for Anoni when she formed Antony and the Johnsons and began performing regularly at venues like the Knitting Factory. She still maintained an ensemble approach, but it was streamlined and not nearly as dense as the Black Lips stagings. These new shows, which mostly focused on her singing as a soloist, were absolutely gorgeous. She eventually caught the attention of Willem Dafoe. He cast her in the film Animal Factory, which introduced her to a larger audience. When Dafoe would appear at these performances, people would joke that Jesus was in the audience, referencing his role in The Last Temptation of Christ. Not long after our first performance as Boob, the Squeezebox Band was offered a special set on a side stage at the 1995 Lollapalooza Festival at Randall's Island. The band Hole, who was at the peak of their popularity, was headlining the festival. We were invited to join the Squeezebox Band as featured performers and were thrilled to have a second chance on stage, especially at that huge festival. We wore matching zebra print outfits and covered La Tigre's classic track, Cars That Go Boom, changing the lyrics to say, we like the boys, the boys that like boob. For props, we brought blow-up sex dolls on stage and crowd surfed them over the audience. It was an incredible experience and we were so happy to be included as part of the Squeezebox presentation. Desi and I discussed the possibility of assembling a group of musicians of our own to make boob into a full-fledged band. We sent word out through our network that we were looking for a drummer, a guitarist, and a bass player. Desi quickly recruited a Japanese skater girl from Parsons named Mayumi who played drums. A young Filipino beauty, Sonia Sonic, was interested in playing bass and knew a talented guitar player from Florida named Scott Johnson. We all met at Limelight one night and seemed to have a good rapport, so we booked out some rehearsal space at Funkadelic Studios and developed a complete set of original songs. We invited another club kid named John Boy to be the third front person. John Boy was a sparkling club success in his hometown of Chicago before he moved to New York to study shoe design. He appeared with the club kids on the 1992 episode of Geraldo and would eventually go on to work with John Galliano, designing shoes for Christian Dior and other brands. He accepted our invitation to be part of Boob and created a separate persona called Loxana. At Limelight, I met another queen who had arrived to New York from Chicago named Theron Smothers. He was working as an announcer at a dodgy lap dancing venue called the Harmony Theater, where a number of the girls from the scene would moonlight for extra cash. We became best friends and I hired him to be my assistant in the clubs. He was very supportive of Boob and was always down for an adventure, so he became our manager. Years later, he went on to work with World of Wonder, helping to create and develop Drag Race, among other projects. We booked Boob's first performance as a real band for Disco 2000 on Limelight's main stage. It was a huge honor and privilege to be able to present ourselves in such a professional performance setting. In addition to being a nightclub, Limelight was a well-respected concert venue. We asked Impala and the art crew to build a set based on my drawings, and a full-color poster was designed to promote the event. Arthur Weinstein executed beautiful lighting effects as we performed to a sold-out crowd. The concert was incredibly successful and most of our crowd seemed genuinely thrilled that we were venturing off in this new direction. Later on in the evening, while hanging out in the shampoo lounge, I met a brand new arrival from San Francisco who went by the name of Bob. She was very tall and voluptuous and referred to herself as a drag queen, even though she was a real woman. She had a stunning face like an iconic movie star from old Hollywood, but with hair and makeup similar to Nina Hagen's. For our performance that night, she had created a giant bra out of colored Tupperware bowls in tribute to our band's name. Underneath the bowls, she had real breasts that actually matched their scale. I thought she was absolutely lovely. Since she was new in town and needed a gig, I asked if she would be interested in being the body positive mascot for our band. She enthusiastically agreed. That night was the beginning of what would be a three-year stretch that led us to performing at a number of venues around New York. We eventually made our way into Spa Recording Studio and cut our own record, which was followed by a small tour of northeastern cities. We weren't real singers, but with our talented musicians, we found ways to make some interesting noise. In addition to our dynamic costumes and DIY stage theatrics, we were able to come up with a sound that was uniquely ours. We collaborated with different clothing designers like Carlos Pistol and Jimmy Helvin for our stage looks. Each of our shows was defined by a theme which informed the development of our costumes and stage sets. 
Every member of the band came up with an interpretation of the theme that adhered to a strict color palette. This approach yielded some healthy competition, and it was always exciting to see who came up with the strongest look by Showtime. Boob was a vehicle that allowed us to start thinking outside of the parameters of the Gaetian Empire, while still making use of the resources and grooming that we had attained while coming up under that umbrella. We remained anchored in the mega clubs, but began inhabiting a number of alternative spaces, including music venues like CBGB, Tramps, Downtime, The Bank, The Knitting Factory, and West Beth Theater, where we staged our concerts. <laughs> 